right. Um, I'm excited to introduce you. Um, today we have Dr. Kate Medicus. She is the Executive Vice President at Ruta Cardinal here in Tucson, Arizona. Ruta Cardinal is a world leader in optical systems engineering, specifically in design, tolerancing, and precision assembly. Kate's previous work includes being the metrology technical lead and an optic, optical component manufacturer and building instruments for precision surface metrology. Kate has experience in private industry, a national lab, and in an academic setting. She's involved with SBIE and ASPE, the American Society for Precision Engineering. And she's going to be giving us a talk today on can you make it, which I, I like to have as my in my class when I see ZMAX drawings that are, and I say, wow, is that air holding up those lenses? Oh. And so hopefully she'll help with that. Yeah, well, we're not going to talk about that part. So. Um, thank you, Jeff. Thank you for having me, and um, hopefully you'll uh, get a little bit of interesting information out of this talk. So what, what we're going to be talking about today is stuff that my company, Ruta Cardinal, has learned over the years. So what Ruta Cardinal does is we manufacture a lot of custom optical systems. So if you're designing an optical system for a custom application, you can't just use off-the-shelf optical components. So you're using ZMAX or Code 5 or some sort of optimization software to figure out what kind of lenses and in what combination can meet those specifications that, that you need. But what you get out of that software is not always manufacturable. And so what I'm going to try to tell you, and from the perspective that I've worked at an optical manufacturing facility, is what can be manufactured and how you might be able to change an optical design to meet manufacturability. So um, there will be a few times I might ask for, for audience input. Feel free to mumble under your breath or shout it out as you see fit, either way. Um, OK, so probably most of you have seen something like this, the output of a lens design software. You run the optimization. You want to minimize something, minimize spot size. You want a certain focal length. You need to be able to image really well. So once we take that, we want to get those lenses made. We know we're not going to be able to buy them off the shelf, so we're going to have to start talking to manufacturers about them. So in this single lens, biconvex lens, we're going to assume it's rotationally symmetric. We're not dealing with too complex right here. How many parameters do you think are necessary to describe this lens to the manufacturer? Five? Two hundred? Something? Something in there. Somewhere about 32 parameters, which includes parameters of the lens and tolerances of it, are necessary to get what you want. So it's more than just, I mean, if you look at it, you think, OK, all I need is two radius and a CT and the material. So that's like four, right? It's not enough. So we're going to be talking about some of those parameters and what, what manufacturers want to see in those parameters. This is what a final optical print may look like. So you have to take that single surface, that single lens that you made, and you have to make it into something like this to give it to the manufacturer so you can get a piece of glass back. So most of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about today is about brittle glass manufacturing. I'll touch a little bit on plastic optics and glass molding, but this is about brittle glass and crystal manufacturing. So how are those types of lenses made? And most of the stuff that we talk about are standard size components, you know, from about yay big to about yay big in things that you might be able to hold in your hands. When you start to get to the big stuff or the really, really tiny stuff, different rules apply. So this stuff is about 80% of what, you know, you see. It's the 80-20 kind of rule. So when you make a glass optic, you, start, you generally start with grinding and polishing. You use a CNC grinder. And what that does is you have an abrasive tool, solid abrasive tool, and it's got diamond embedded in there. And that's used, it moves over the surface, and that's used to cut the surface to the correct radius, to the correct shape. Now what that surface comes out of, what, what the surface that comes out of that machine, it doesn't look shiny, it's flat, it's got a lot of surface damage on it. So, you might use pitch polishing to make that surface shiny, to smooth over that damage. There are some, um, this is, pitch polishing is old. I mean, Newton, Newton did this stuff, right? This is really old. 
but it still has a place in today's manufacturing world. There are some high-speed polishing, some machine polishing, or some pad polishing that doesn't use that, but it's the same type of general process. They're taking a tool, some sort of surface layer, and they're just moving the tool over the surface of the lens in some sort of abrasive slurry. And as you do that, you, you remove the damage that they put in from grind, and then they make it to make it shiny. So you do both sides, surface one, surface two. Then there's some other steps that you have to follow. You can do some steps to do fine finishing, to get some better uh, surfaces than you would out of pitch polishing. One example of that would be MRF polishing. Uh, won't go to the details into polishing, could be a whole nother talk, but that is another polishing process that can be used. Then the lens isn't done, even though both surfaces are shiny and they're ready to go. Two things that need to be done is ledge, led, lens edging. And that's the process of finishing up the diameter and centering both surfaces to each other. These are aspheric lenses that are spherical lenses that we're talking about. Then the vast majority of lenses will go into AR coating, an anti-reflection coating on it, because you lose so much light in the normal optical system that you're going to have to coat it. So, is this convex or concave? Ah, it's a trick question, isn't it, right? What about this one? Right? Yes. Yes. This one. Yes. Okay. Same. Same. I have no idea what these surfaces are. So we should just use positive or, or negative radii, right? That's what we use. That's going to solve everything when we, when we define those lenses. Okay? Same lens. Positive radius, negative radius. Positive radius, negative radius. Which one's right? Well, hmm? What would what the coating wouldn't matter if if the lens? If I'm trying to t ask what surface is convex or concave, inside is inside is glass. I'll give you that. Inside is glass. Outside is air. The manufacturer does not know where your light is coming from. I know you're going to tell me that light always comes from the left. Light does not always come from the left. Today's world, we can, we can expand our minds. We can say that light can come from any direction. It can call itself whatever it wants. Okay, here's another example. We'll just, so we don't even, we, we'll just rely on the drawing, right? You can see it. It's clearly, right? That surface is con convex. Both surfaces are convex. Okay, no problem, right? I don't, is that convex? Is that concave? Is that plano? I don't know. Can't tell. So the answer is to that one. Don't depend on the drawing. Don't assume light comes from the left. So each surface must be labeled concave, convex, or plano. Asterisks. Going A spheres or free forms. Going means that the A sphere goes from from one curvature to the next curvature. Yes. Uh, we expect light to be coming from this direction or indicate the light sort of somehow in the schematic? Yeah, so the, best, the really the best way to do it is just to write this. Surface 1, it has a radius NCX. That's really, really the best way to do it. So then we start with this. All right, we've got our lens. We've got our labi la radius labeled, and we've got... Uh, we know they're both convex. It's got a certain center thickness. We've defined it, and we've given it a diameter. So we've got about enough to give it to the manufacturer, right? Anybody know what's wrong? Hmm? Glass type? We need that information, but there's something else, something about the geometry, something about the picture, the shape. It's too small edge thickness, okay? So let's figure out what the edge thickness of this of this is. So you use the SAG equation. It's really just this equation of a sphere. Radius minus square root radius squared minus diameter over 2 squared. Okay? So the SAG at the edge for both of them is 4.535. The edge thickness is the CT minus 2 times the SAG. So our edge thickness is less than a millimeter right now. So when the manufacturer generally must make the lens oversize, 
this lens will go, when they make it oversized, this will go to negative edge thickness. And since we don't deal with metamaterials or something, we actually have to deal with real materials, and things can't go to negative edge thickness. So it's really something to be really careful about during designs. In addition, that's really too thin to mount on. That's a really sensitive lens for handling. Things that go to a knife edge are scary, and you don't want to make them. So not just for the manufacturer, but for yourself when you're assembling them, you don't want them to go like that. So how do you fix it? You force the software to increase the CT, you reduce the diameter, or you flatten the radii. That will, uh, to flatten the radii, you actually increase it, increase the, the value of the radius. Okay. What's wrong with this one? Yes, the middle. It's just way too thin. Don't. Just don't. Just, just don't. That's, that's just a no. Um, you have to force the software. If something wants to be that thin, figure out why. Why ZMAX? Maybe that lens doesn't need to be there. If it's wanting to be that thin, does it really need to be there? Can you take, can you take away the whole lens and re-optimize? What's wrong with these lenses? And I'll give you the answer. Their aspect ratio is way off. So generally, that's diameter to thickness. So five, less than 5 to 1 is good. 10 to 1 is OK. And 20 to 1 is just being mean. So don't do that. And it comes a lot in um, domes. Things like that. People like to make those really thin domes. Uh, what breaks the rules on that? You know, windows, right? It's right behind you, right? Those break the rules on those a lot, right? That's, but that's also not an optical surface that you're trying to bend light through. If you try to image through that, the distortions, that, the amount of distortions that you're going to get because of how it's mounted, are incredibly high. So if you need to make something with incredibly thin aspect ratios, which people over in your telescope area can think about, how will it be mounted and how will it be used? So all these rules can be broken, but what do you need to do to follow, to, uh, to mitigate those factors? So this one, uh, this is another one that breaks the rules. Fiber optics, right? Glass fiber, that aspect ratio of that is completely different. But the, the manufacturing process and how they make those in the big, long towers and they draw out the fiber is a much different process. So glass can act in that manner, but uh, in normal imaging optics, you're not going to do it that way. OK. What's wrong with this one? We got, we got good radii. We got our center thickness. We've not, we're not, we got a good aspect ratio. We're not too thin. We've labeled our surfaces. We're following all the rules. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's a little pricey. No big deal. We got money. We got money. Anybody? The radii are too close. Exactly. The radii differ only by 100 microns. So it will be very, very difficult to keep track of those surfaces. So it can be done with extreme care that the manufacturer has to follow which surface is which, and then you as the integrator have to be able to install it properly upside down or right side up. But a much better fix is to force those radii to be the same, exactly the same, and allow a different surface to change radius if needed. So that's something to look at during the designs. Are those radii becoming very close to each other? OK. All right, this one. Get a little something different. We got a convex on this side. We got concave, standard center thickness, diameter, not too thin. Anybody like that? Yeah, it's not really flat. We got a really large radius on that. 3,467. Yeah, that's kind of nasty. Yeah, actually, that was my, my example. I increased the radius as I did in the second one. Um, so the fix is really to force that large radio, radii, either convex or concave. Yes? So your radii, you have six, six different figures. Um, but you're worried about uh, calling the radii that's different by three different figures. So is it an accuracy problem? Or is it so, so significant figures. All right. So I don't really care 
about how many digits are in front of there. So total significant figures is not important at all to a manufacturer. It's how many after the decimal place. Not, it's how many microns do you expect me to hold this to? And uh, why, is, why is that a bad thing if you're Oh, like the, this, this previous an answer? It's a problem of systematics. It can be made very, very easily. It can be made. But once I take that lens, once both surfaces are made, and I take it out of the tray, for me to have to figure out which surface is which surface is nigh on impossible, especially once it's AR coded. Yes, absolutely. It can be grinded to that precision without a doubt. It can be made. It's just about the handling of it. Okay, back to the one where we talk about the large radius. If you have a large radius, there might be a reason for it, but in general, unless you absolutely need it, the fix is to force that to a plano. So that's a much better, um, it's just, it can be done, it's just, eh, why bother? Okay, next one. All right, we've got matching radii, we've got a decent center thickness, we've got a good aspect ratio, we've got the same radius. All righty. The diameter, exactly. Do I, I, do I need to give this talk? Y'all all right? I don't, I don't need to be here. Okay. Okay. So definition of a clear aperture, if you haven't heard from, heard it. Clear aperture is the diameter over which the tolerances are applicable. So that would be the three main tolerances that that would be applicable are irregularity, well, four, actually, irregularity, um, uh, radius tolerance, your coating, and your um, scratch dig. So those four tolerances. I'm going to say the word must with an asterisk. Must be smaller than the actual lens diameter because of the polishing, edging, and coating reasons. All of those reasons would want you to have that smaller diameter. So your fix is make the diameter larger. So once you make the diameter larger, you're really going to have to start watching your edge thickness. So those two can go hand in hand. 80% um, your ratio of your CA to your diameter, no problems, good. 90%, you're still good, no problems. And again, if you want to be mean, you can, and you want to spend a lot of money, you know, that's part of it. You can go to 97%. Um, a spheres always have a little bit of special rules. They would like a little bit larger CA um, to diameter ratio. Okay, here's one that breaks the rules. Um, this, I, um, I've seen a lot of examples of, of, the, of these mirrors. These are for the ELT. Um, over in Europe that's being built. And so the ELT has, uh, I don't know how many of these, 798 hexagonal segments, about a meter, meter or so kind of segments. The requirements on these are to have absolutely no CA. They have edge to edge, their full specifications. And here's an example of a group that was working on that polishing process. So they put a, a, a test plate test plate allows you to see the fringes, the dark light, to see any uh, surface errors. So you can see this dark line right on the edge of the mirror. And what that is showing is you're showing you've got a, an edge roll on the surface, which is very, very common in traditional, in traditional polishing. You either get an up edge or a down edge. And that's why a lot of people want to have that CA in there. So they did, they've done some research work. They've been able to smooth that out. And so you can see while there is still some edge roll down, it's much smaller, and they're not getting the edge up. So that's a much, a much better process for them. So again, there's always ways to break the rules, but what is the standard way of doing it? OK, so this is what we got. We got good aspect ratio. We're not too thin. We've labeled our surfaces. We got the same radius. We've got acceptable CA. Some of Soluble KDP, potassium dihydrogen phosphate, KDP. Materials, materials, materials. So what material are you going to make your lens at? You get those nice glass charts and you pick, I want this index and I need this and I need to balance my color, so I'm going to use this material and this material. Let's talk about materials. I don't like materials. All right, if you want the lens to disappear in water, 
All right, that means it's going to start absorbing the material and it's going to go away. You've got some interesting materials, cesium bromide, potassium chloride, the salts, those salts. If you want the lenses to break to thermal shock, calcium fluoride is awesome, right? Because it, that, that transmission range of calcium fluoride is from down here to all the way up there, so I should just make everything out of calcium fluoride, right? Yeah, but if I want to go from not minus 30 to plus 30, and yeah, that's not very good. So thermal shock. Big, uh, big issue when your fluoride materials, barium fluoride is even more sensitive than calcium fluoride. So handling issues, cost. If the lens isn't too big, so lots of materials have issues if you want to make the lens thick Some of the, and how they're grown. A lot of those crystals, they don't want to grow them thick. They can grow them out, but growing them thick is an issue. If you want to pay a gazillion dollars for a lens, you can have it made out of diamond because that's awesome. Um, maybe if you want to get it in, t in two years, you could, so many materials, and I won't say the name of the company, Shot Glass, but that's, that's two years, yeah. They have a schedule, they're not going to break their schedule, and that's their schedule. Yep. If you want to get sick, you could do it, you could make it out of leaded glass, that's all right. You, everybody knows why we use the N in front of the materials now, right? The N is the lead taken out of it. So it's really hard to find leaded glass anymore. Um, another one, beryllium. Anybody know what that mirror is? The James Webb Space Telescope was made out of beryllium. Guess what beryllium is? It is a hazard, especially in dust form, especially when being ground into fine dust, which you have to do when you grind. So beryllium, scary. That stuff's scary. Um, if you want a separate waste stream, Cacalginite glasses. So these are the new latest trend in the IR materials. They require a different waste disposal. You can't just pour that stuff down the drain after you're done polishing. So materials is a big question. So a lot of suppliers will have preferred, preferred glass lists. Use them. There's the reason why they have them. So you have to talk to your suppliers and have a really good reason for wanting an oddball material. It can be done. Cost is time and money, but it can be done. Cut. All right, here we go. All right, what do we got? Good, uh, up, 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 good CA. Standard material, NBK7. Okay. We can do this. We just added a coating. No problem. No problem? Ah, yes it is. Yeah, that's just like impossible. Impossible, possible, it's all relative, but yeah, basically that's impossible. Why is that impossible? So standard reflection on a standard glass material is about 4%. Okay, you can get it down 2.1%, but can you get it down to 0.1% over that entire range? That would be very, it is very, very difficult to do that. Coating is a very complicated issue. The difficulties in coating increase for a lower specification, a lower number and for longer ranges. Difficult coatings have difficulties for very low wavelengths if you're less than 300 nanometers or so if you're trying to get down there. So in, can, in trying to assign a coating range, considerations that you might want to think of, are you going to do R max or R average? So a lot, of, a lot of things we'll talk about R average over the range of wavelengths. But what if all those peaks end up lining up? Are you going to have a problem meeting your overall transmission specs? Coatings also are going to have a question in uniformity correction. Do you get the same anti-reflection uh, ability in the center of the lens versus at the edge of a lens? And this is an example from Optimax of when they very intentionally made a poorly corrected optic that, could, that had a change in reflection over the surface. So that's something to think about. There are manufacturers that can handle very steep surfaces and be able to correct that uniformity. Um, so that depends on your angle of incidence. So are you, how, how bad is your angle of incidence on the edge, of the edge of the lens, and do you need to specify that to have a certain um, reflectivity at that? Uh, witness samples. So a lot of, in a lot of cases, um, you want to specify that I want to get a separate witness sample done so that I can have traceability of my coating because you can't always test the coating on the actual lens surface itself. You use a witness sample to test that. 
Coatings for space applications or high energy laser applications also need to be considered. Standard coatings generally don't work in that realm. So you want to think about where the application is. Okay. All right. We fixed our coating. We got a good material. I didn't, I actually didn't add anything. So what's wrong? How? Somebody's all my presentation. No. Cheating. Tolerances. It is tolerances. So what is here is actually good. That describes the lens. That describes what is, is necessary to get it. But nobody can make a perfect surface. It can't be done. Nobody can make a perfect lens. So we're going to have to put some tolerances on that. So standard tolerances, you're going to have to tolerance those radii. You're going to have to tolerance the irregularity. That's the deviation from perfect of that sphere. Tolerance the center thickness, tolerance the diameter, the scratch dig on the surface, the material requirements, the edge finish. So that, in general, so a couple of these things can be standard practices, standard finish, something like that, and the bevel. You know, you could also, for a bevel, you can say standard bevel. A bevel is the cut on the edges. They'll never make a perfect sharp. Most mat it would be very rare to make a perfect sharp. And you'll chip it, and then it'll be a disaster anyway. Okay. So the best place to go look at standard tolerances are Optimax's tolerance chart. You can Google it, Optimax tolerance chart. They should have brought giveaways here. If they didn't, then you should yell at them. Um, so those are standard tolerances. So really the actual best way is for you to start to learn how ZMAX and how the other tools do tolerances of optical systems. It's really hard. I will tell you it is not an easy thing to figure out how much deviation certain things can have and your optical system still work. This is something that we do and that we're, my company is experts at and it's still really hard and every system is a little different. This is a great starting point to think about what does my optical system do if I have these tolerances. Yes? How conservative? Do you try to exactly all of us? Or do you try to? It needs back. Ship it. It's good. <laughs> I, I know. The, you, want, you want them to say, well, well, we'll make it a little bit better. But there's reasons why they don't do that. One, it puts, puts the part at risk. And that, that is a big thing. If the part is done, it really should be done. That I'm going to trust that the, that the customer put the right spec on the print. And two, money. Cost me more money. Um, it's an interesting, the other interesting question is, it gets into, there's actually research topics and, and questions, how these tolerances are distributed on manufactured parts are not how the softwares um, model it. And um, we wrote a, the company wrote a paper on it, and it's not an easy thing. So I, it's something that I'd like to, in general, work on to improve, but I don't know how to do that in fully. Okay, so we talked about tolerances. All right. What if I want to do something cool, like put some glass on the side and I, cause I, so I can grab onto it so that I can use more of the surface so I'm not melting off of it? Can I, can I do that? You think that? You think that can be done? Maybe. Maybe if I do it this way, it can be done. You can do it in glass, but what you have to do is you have to be really careful that the curve continuation here doesn't cut into that because you need to be able to have that curve continuation during the polishing process. So it can be done. It looks really silly right here, but there are optics that I've seen it looks makes more sense. And on Bicon Caves, you can put a nice simple step edge in the, in, the, in the optics, so it can be done. Where it's much different, though, is in plastic or molded glasses. In plastic, you can do so many interesting things because of the different manufacturing process. There's no need for curve continuation. So I was doing some Googling and figuring out how plastic optics are made, and they show this print. And I'm like, oh my 
gosh, you can't make that. And they're like, and they're, they're, the caption is, this is a good example of a plastic molded component. And I'm like, okay, more to learn. So when they, when they put in their material, either by injection or if they're starting from a, a glob of material and then pushing it into a, into a mold, they, um, they can put in these mounting features. So the mounting features can exactly become part of the glass. There's a step here that they can use that's independent. These are things you could never do in glass optics. So plastics have advantages and disadvantages over glass. It's very application specific. If you're, if you're in a complex uh, environment with temperature changes and, and all kinds of other stuff and your wavelength ranges, you're not going to want to really talk about plastics in most cases. Um, but if you want high, um, high quantity consumer applications where you can, where you can um, handle when it's a more limited range, plastic is, might be more advantageous than glasses. Yep. Glass molding. Glass molding is a thing too. That's kind of cool. Um, so in, you make the molds, you put in a little bit of glass, you heat it up, you press it, <clears throat> you pop out the lens, you get your lens feature, and then you repeat it. That's how glass molding does. And again, here's another one. You have ability to create features not possible in traditional glass manufacturing. There are limited sets of materials for glass molding. And again, a lot of that has to do with the environment and the stability of the materials. So, and it's also another thing where quantity matters. If you're going to go bigger, uh, bigger quantities, that's something that you want to do. So these are things like this. And, and other, you couldn't do that in normal glass. You couldn't have that edge there with that. And so this is a, is a requirement of this print that wouldn't be required in the glass print, this blend radius. So they can't make a sharp, but what is the, what is the kind of radius that the person would want there? So that's a thing if you're trying to design those kind of features into, your, into, the, into the glass or into the plastic either way, they need to be considered. All right, a little bit on measurements. So uh, measurements is actually my background, and that's where I started in the manufacturing world in talking about how a surface is measured. So these are some really typical tools that are used in optics manufacturing. You've got a Fizeau interferometer. Uh, Zygo is a brand. 4D is another brand. But it's a standard tool that's used to measure the irregularity, that's the deviation from perfect, of a spherical surface. You have profilometers, so this can measure a full, full map of the surface. A profilometer will measure a single trace. So the, that can be used for um, regular spheres, A spheres, more complex surfaces. It's not as accurate. Uh, it can also be used to measure radius, regularity and radius. A, uh, the most precise radius measurement is an interferometric radius measurement. That's where you use a Fizeau interferometer and you move the optic between two positions and you measure the change in that position and that is defined as the radius of curvature. So you, you have to use kind of one of these interferometers and then you have to use some sort of measurement tool and typically you would use a displacement interferometer to measure those, those two positions. So I'm going to bring up two examples where these tools fail based on the optical design. One is a co common problem is that the diameter of an optic is too large for the Fizeau measurement on the convex surface. So if I've got a convex optic here in green and my front surface, the center of curvature is back here. And the optic must be placed so that the center of curvature of the surface under test is at the center of curvature of the test beam. So in this case, you see if my center of curvature is placed there and my optic is in the right place, I cannot see this area. It, it is not viewable from my area, of, of, from my interferometer. I might be able to switch to a faster transmission sphere. That's this front optic. And in this case, I'm, I can see more of the surface, but I still can't see the whole surface. So what a manufacturer will do in this case They'll actually test it on the center, then they'll tilt the optic, and they'll test the edge. They'll call that a center and edge test. So they're not seeing the full irregularity, 
So if you have an irregularity specification of one fringe, they'll look at the center and they're like, yeah, well, they'll, they'll be able to measure it. They'll say, okay, I got a half a fringe of irregularity on the center, and then when I measure the edge, I got a quarter fringe of irregularity. So half a fringe plus a quarter fringe is less than one fringe, so good. I can ship it. It's good. So if that isn't good enough for the, for the, um, for the person who's buying the optic, you need to specify a full aperture irregularity test. And then they might be able to use a stitching interferometer. So in many cases, a stitching interferometer, they were originally designed for A-spheres, but they work really well for measuring full apertures. So that's when they tilt the optic, and they measure in multiple locations, and then they stitch that data together. So that's a really common problem for convex, large diameter convex surfaces. Another one, another common problem, is when your radius is too long for your bench. So I talked about that the radius happens at two positions. There's, there's the laser. So you have to, this is your optic, this uh, just con, concave um, line right there. So I have to place it at the center of curvature, okay? And then I have to move it so its center of curvature is at the interferometer's center of curvature. So but right now, my optic is off the table. It's existing in space. So hopefully, the manufacturer has really long tables. But if they don't, they can't measure the radius to the precision required. So that's, if you're, if you're making really large radius parts, that's something to consider. So there's so much other stuff. That I, didn't, that I didn't talk about because I ran out of time making the presentation, but don't tell anybody that. Um, A-spheres. A-spheres, A-spheres, A-spheres. So example from Edmund Optics, what does an A-sphere do? Changes that front surface and reduces that spherical aberration. Manufacturing of A-spheres, complex, doable, more things to consider. Freeforms, you add another, that's where you, you make it, um, they're non-symmetrical, non-rotationally symmetrical. Mechanical components. There's adds in a whole nother level of complexity. Once it's, we just, all we talked about was things floating in space. What happens when you try to hold them? Assembly considerations, how are we going to put it together? And there's lots of other stuff. So, um, so I guess that keeps me in a job. I don't know, something like that. Um, how about this one? Anything wrong with this one? It's a cheat answer. It's done. You put it on a pretty paper, you put your label, your logo on it, and you can send it to the manufacturer. You might make it nice. You might think about putting it in an ISO 10110 format. It's done. It's got all the, it's got everything that's needed. And that's all I got. Anybody got any questions? <laughs>